My name is Patrick Lahey, and I am the president and co-founder of Triton Submarines here in Sebastian, Florida. Uh, Triton is a small company that manufactures a very unique series of products. We have about 14 different models of human-occupied vehicles or human-occupied submersibles that we manufacture. Uh, they range from subs that carry a single person to ones that will carry as many as 66 people. Uh, they range in diving depths from as shallow as 100 meters to as deep as 11,000 meters. We actually built the deepest diving human-occupied vehicle in the world. And you know, that was a, a very challenging project that we took on back in, 19, in 2015. 2016 and, and we completed in 2019 and that sub continues to be used. But uh, I, my background is I began scuba diving at 13, commercial diving at 19, checked out of my first submarine when I was 21, realized I loved the fact that in a human occupied vehicle, you could go as deep as you wanted and you didn't have any of the physical limitations that you did in a, in a, uh, as a diver. So we didn't have to worry about decompression or physical exertion. And I found it really liberating to dive into submersible. Plus, I've always wanted to go deeper and see what's beyond where I could reach as a traditional diver, even as a commercial diver. And submersibles have allowed me to do just that. So hopefully that's a bit of a background on. on no, that's that's great. That's perfect. Do you mind if we just jump right into student questions? Not at all, please. Okay. Fire away. One of the students wanted to know what was it like uh, diving on the Titanic? Well, diving on the Titanic was both remarkable and sort of sad in some ways. You know, you're aware of the fact when you're on the site that it was a, a, a scene of terrible human suffering more than 100 years ago. But I suppose re, one of the reassuring things about visiting the wreck, which lies in about 12,800 feet of water, about 3,800 meters, is just how beautiful the wreck is and how uh, abundant life is on the wreck. Uh, people often talk about the fact there's more life on the wreck now than there was, you know, on that fateful day more than 100 years ago. And it's true, there's all kinds of beautiful hard and soft corals. Uh, it's become kind of a refuge in, in a very deep and, and inhospitable part of the ocean. And I suppose the first thing that struck me about seeing the wreck was the enormity of it. It's a huge wreck. And it, you really come face to face with it when you sort of pull up to it and you look at it and you realize, you know, at one time this was the largest ship in the world, or not so today, but still it's, it's an awe, you know, it's an awe, awe inspiring thing to see the ship, that's for sure. And uh, just so the kids have some reference, how long does it take to actually get from the surface down to the Titanic? Well, the Titanic is relatively shallow uh, for the submarine that we were using. That sub is a sub that can dive to 11,000 meters. So you could actually, we were able to get to that wreck site in about an hour and maybe an hour and a half, something like that. That is absolutely incredible. One of the kids wanted to know, um, what were some things that you were passionate about studying when you were in high school? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know that I was passionate about much except diving, you know, and I started diving when I was 13. And I just loved the idea of being underwater and anything related to the water. So I, you know, be honest with you, I wasn't a great student. I, I wasn't uh, very focused on school, uh, which is probably not a good thing to admit uh, to a group of students. Uh, but, you know, the one thing that I did love and was passionate about was the ocean. And that has been a consistent theme through my whole life. So if I were to give you guys any advice, it would be to follow your bliss, you know, to do that thing you love. Because I think if you do that, you're, you're bound to be happy and you're bound to be successful. That's great advice. And uh, so we'll just, we'll keep the, uh, there's a lot of questions coming here for you. Uh, sure. they, they just wanted to know what are some of the more interesting dives beside the Titanic that, that you've experienced personally? Well, you know, that's another very good question. I have been lucky to have had a career diving in submersibles that spans nearly four decades. So during that nearly four decade uh, career, I've had some pretty extraordinary diving experiences. Certainly diving on Titanic is, is among the highlights. 
diving on the Space Shuttle Challenger when we were recovering the pieces of that uh, uh, vehicle after the accident in 1986 was, was certainly one of them. Some of the great scientific dives that I've had the, the privilege to be part of, you know, diving in the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, uh, seeing the vertical migration, you know, diving with some deep sea sharks and, and getting to see these animals, these extraordinary animals that have been around for hundreds of millions of years and remain unchanged. Uh, you know, I guess it would be hard to narrow it down to, uh, you know, just a single dive or even a handful of dives because I've probably made over 10,000 sub dives, maybe even more in my lifetime. And, you know, every time you get in a sub and you dive, you just never know what you're going to see. I always find it exhilarating to, to dive in a human occupied uh, submersible. That is, I can't believe that you've done it that many times. Does it seem like... <laughs> I know obviously your first time was very scary. Is it still like, is there anxiety and nerves and all that kind of you know, stuff? Going I, on? Wouldn't, I wouldn't describe it as scary at all. I, I would describe it as exhilarating. I mean, the first dive that I made, you know, probably it still is, it's so firmly etched in my memory. I was diving on a blowout preventer on a drilling rig offshore California. So it wasn't very glamorous dive, but the fact is it made an indelible impression on me that I could dive to, I think it was about 1400 feet on this blowout preventer and then come right back up and get out and, you know, have lunch. Uh, I just thought that was incredible. And, you know, it was relatively easy. Uh, and I think because I had been working with that craft for a little while, I was super excited about the idea of, of diving in it. And so when I first got in it and I plunged through the interface and I'm in this cobalt blue water, I mean, you know, it, it is your heart's racing, but not because you're scared, but because you're so excited. I can, I mean, imagine, I, that. I can imagine, you know, flying your first airplane or going up in a rocket, you know, any one of those things, uh, you know, probably has a similar uh, effect on you, but the sub thing really, Quite literally took my breath away. Um, and I can imagine that. We have a, a question from Emma. Uh, she's in Italy. And Emma, you should be able to unmute. Uh, you had a pretty good question, so you can go ahead and ask. Uh, hello. Um, I want to ask you something. Because this summer, maybe I will, do the, I will take the diving lessons. So um, do you have some suggestion for me in general? Well, I do. I think I would encourage all of you who have the opportunity to learn how to dive because diving, you know, even if it's wearing a mask and a snorkel, but seeing the ocean uh, from below the surface uh, and, and getting a chance to look up close at, at how beautiful it is, is something that will leave a lasting impression on you. I think the greatest way for us to create advocacy in our oceans and a concern about our oceans is to get more people uh, like you, Emma, with dive gear, snorkel gear, or even better in a sub, uh, you know, having a chance to see the ocean from that perspective um, will, as I said, for me too, left, will leave you with an indelible impression, you know, something that you'll never forget. And I think, it has the capacity to change how you view the ocean. Because when we look out over the ocean, you, you can't, your eyes can't penetrate it. You know, you can't really see it. And so you don't really know what it's like until you can either get in a sub or put a mask on and snorkel or even better, a set of tanks like you're going to do, Emma. Um, so I would just encourage you to enjoy it. And that, that feeling of weightlessness, this sense that you're like uh, in inner space, uh, I guarantee you, you're going to love it. That's, that's good. And good luck, Emma. That sounds like so much fun. Um, I, we have a question, an awesome question from Flavia. And uh, you should be able to unmute to ask your question. Go Hello? ahead, Flavia. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. So when you... When you build a, a, a submarine, so a submergible that you can carry persons, 
How do you test it before knowing that it is secure? That's a, an, an excellent question. And one of the things about the subs that we build at Triton is that they're all fully accredited. That means they go through a really arduous certification process that involves a significant amount of testing, including taking the pressure boundary, the part of the craft that houses the people and putting it into a test chamber and subjecting it to the pressure that it would experience at its maximum diving depth plus usually 25%. So as well as doing all the sort of calculations and all the analysis, we do physically test everything on the sub before people ever get in it and use it. So these are extraordinarily safe vehicles. They're built to exceedingly high standards. Uh, everything from the materials that we use to produce them and uh, to validate the, uh, the, the suitability of those materials to full up testing of the submarine once it's completed. So when you get in a fully accredited sub like the type we build at Triton, you can be assured you're in the safest piece of equipment you could get in. Much safer than the car that you get into without thinking about it. That's uh, it's good to know. And you guys are kind of along the lines of like, it sounds like building a spaceship, the safety like standards you guys are at. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's a, a good point. You know, people often, make comparisons between submersibles uh, that dive into inner space and you know spacecraft that go into outer space. But there's actually some pretty significant differences. When you go to space, you're dealing with the absence of one atmosphere. When you go into the ocean, especially if you go to the deepest point in the ocean, you may be dealing with as many as 1,100 atmospheres. You're talking about crushing pressures. Spacecraft can be sort of almost paper thin, uh, whereas a submersible, uh, for example, the sub that we built that goes to full ocean depth, that pressure hull is made of 90 millimeter thick or three and a half inch thick solid titanium. We had a, a pretty good question from Sophia and uh, quite a few kids were wondering about this and I was wondering this myself. Sophia, you should be able to ask. Uh, well, I want you to know uh, which is the rarest sea creature you have ever seen. Mm. I would say the rarest sea creature that I've ever seen that I was very lucky to see, and I don't know that very many people, maybe nobody has had the opportunity to see this little creature. It's not very you know, significant. It's not like it's a terrifying animal. It's probably only about that big, but it's called a... Um, it's the deepest uh, fish in the ocean. And I got to remember the name of it now. I apologize, you know, I, I should be able to rattle it off to you. Um, but, uh, you know, it was at about 8,000 meters, which is the deepest that you will ever find a fish. So I was incredibly lucky. I was on a dive with a gentleman by the name of Larry Connor. Uh, and I think it's called a, uh, a squire snailfish, not a very exotic sounding thing, but the fact that you're seeing an animal that lives and thrives in 8,000 meters of water depth, which is, you know, sort of 27, 28,000 feet uh, is extraordinary in its own right. Uh, but, you know, the fact that we got to see one, the only time people have ever seen them before, I think, is when they've been recovered by landers and they were being analyzed in a, in a laboratory. So seeing one alive was, was pretty neat. But I've been lucky enough to see a lot of other cool animals too, including we did a documentary in 2012 with NHK and the Discovery Channel where we filmed a number of really unusual deep sea sharks. I think it was called, I'm trying to remember the name of the documentary, but you know, we think, film things like goblin sharks and six gills and mega mouth and, you know, all these really rare sharks that are hundreds of millions of years old. In fact, they are effectively unchanged. You see a, a fossilized remains, you know, like a fossil of a, of a goblin shark or a mega mouth shark. And it's the same as the animal that you see because the conditions in those ex extraordinary depths are unchanged. That's really interesting to like see. It's almost like a different world that you've been experienced to that 
I know I'll never. And that's <laughs> it. So it's our that. world. That's the it, thing. It's our world. You know, people always talk about, you know, these alien creatures, but they're not alien. They're part of our planet. They're part of, you know, the, the world that we all live on, but they are almost alien like to us because so few people have the opportunity, the privilege to actually see them. And my hope, my goal is that I can get more people like all of you on this call today to see the ocean from the perspective that I've been so lucky to see it from. Absolutely. And, uh, before we let you go, is there any advice, you know, obviously because you are very accomplished in, in the things that you've done in your career, and we thank you for connecting with us again this year. I'm not sure if any of you students remember him from last year, uh, but he connected with us last year and he's connecting with us this year. He's kind enough to uh, connect with us. What kind of advice would you give to these kids as they kind of go off into the world, whether they want to go into marine biology or deep sea exploration, or they want to do something completely different? What well, advice would you again, give them? I would, I would reiterate what I said earlier, which is that you absolutely owe it to yourselves. You owe it to your own happiness and to your future potential success to do that thing you love, whether it's playing music, whether it's, you know, making something, painting, uh, a career in the ocean, a doctor, a lawyer, you know, whatever it might be, do that thing you love. Uh, because if you do, you're going to work harder at it and the chances of you being successful at it are, are much greater. And, and I would also go further to say that even if you decide not to pursue an oceanic career, which probably most of you won't, uh, take an interest in the ocean. The ocean is the most important part of our world. You know, I think when people have the opportunity to go into space, probably one of the first things they realize is that our planet is a blue planet for a reason. That's because most of it, three quarters of it are covered with water. The ocean controls our weather. It provides the food we eat and the oxygen we depend on to survive. And I would hope that whatever career you choose, uh, and I hope it is something that involves the ocean, but whatever career you choose, Take an interest in the ocean because the ocean needs our advocacy, needs our support. And it's going to require young people like all of you on this call to change fundamentally that relationship we have with the ocean, where we start to care about it, start to look after it, because our future is inextricably linked to the health of our oceans.